All right, Balancers, today's guest is a best-selling author, clinical psychologist, and internationally recognized expert in mindfulness and self-compassion, two topics I'm very, very passionate about and excited to get stuck into. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Oprah, NPR, and The American Psychologist. I am really excited to have Shauna Shapiro on the Balance Area podcast today. Shauna, a warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I approached you to come on the podcast because I was not only interested in the topics, the big topics that you speak about that really speak to the core and the heart of this podcast, but I'm also really curious and interested in how you and your life story kind of brought you to this path. Now, I know you had a little bit of um, a darker experience when you were younger, when you were 17, and you share the story of how um, this experience kind of led you to relearning how to be in your body and really embracing mindfulness in a different way. So could you, would you mind walking us through that tough time? Yeah, I I like how you just phrased it, relearning how to live in my body, because that's really what it was, um, was relearning how to live my whole life. Um, So when I was 17, I had spinal fusion surgery. I had a metal rod put in my spine. And I went from this healthy, active teenager to lying in a hospital bed, unable to walk. I was in the hospital bed for six months. Um, It was a very difficult time. And I think what was hardest was my whole life I'd worked to be a volleyball player. I played every day. I practiced. I, you know, went to the gym and I'd just gotten a scholarship to play at Duke University, which was my dream. And a few weeks later was when I had we found out that my spine had curved so much it was going to puncture my lungs and we had to operate. And so really overnight, yeah, I went from this kind of my whole dream coming true to really never playing volleyball again, um, to being in a lot of physical pain and to all these really scary thoughts of like, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to walk again? Am I going to always be in pain? Am I going to you know, have a limp? Am I going to look weird? Like all these terrifying thoughts. And so I became really depressed, um, really anxious. And I remember just a couple of months after the surgery, just lying in that hospital bed, really not having the tools to cope. And my father gave me a book. Um, it's called Wherever You Go, There You Are by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. And I opened the book and the very first sentence said, whatever's happened to you, it's already happened. The only thing that matters is now what? And it was as if this path opened up for me, that I wasn't stuck, that I still had choice. I could still move forward. And the book was about mindfulness. So I started reading everything I could about mindfulness. And a few years later, once I had recovered enough strength, I went to Thailand and Nepal and went to the monasteries there to study mindfulness because it had really helped me out of this incredibly dark time. And it was at the monastery, um, I did a a long silent retreat. It was during that time that just as you said, I learned to kind of re-inhabit my body, to really re-inhabit my mind actually, to start to choose where I put my attention as opposed to just getting it pulled into the future and all my fears or into the past and all my regrets. And it was through that experience that really led me to this whole life's work of mindfulness. If you hadn't gone through that experience, you may not have been doing the work that you're doing now. And it's really, it's, I really love always hearing people's stories. I mean, obviously hindsight is a beautiful thing, but I really appreciate hearing people's stories because for anyone listening or dialing in right now that is going through a tough time or they're experiencing something, they're not sure how it fits. It's always so nice to hear these stories to just remind you and give you that zoom out that it will form a part all the dots kind of connect at some point I wanted to ask you now that you've kind of you've obviously grown you've built a career out of this when you look back at that experience what are the most profound mindset shifts you've had in terms of your worldview your outlook that have really stayed with you to date yeah it's a great question I think you know the first kind of radical shift for me was the realization that change was possible, that I wasn't stuck. I think I was living my life at that point feeling like this hopelessness of how could anything 
positive ever happened um, because the reality was I was going to always have a metal rod in my spine. I was probably going to always face some limitations physically, and I was never going to play volleyball again. So those are real things, right? And no amount of positive thinking could shift it. But this kind of newfound understanding that the brain and body are always changing, this is really the foundation of neuroplasticity, is that our brain and nervous system are constantly rewiring based on our experience. And what that means is we always have choice. And what that means is it's never too late to change. You're never stuck, no matter what's happened to you, no matter what mistakes you've made, there's always this sense of hope. And it doesn't mean life's gonna be perfect, and it doesn't mean it's gonna look the way you thought it was, but you always have choice. And I think that to me was radical. That, that I had some choice. Um, so I think that was one huge mindset. Another mindset, huge shift and, and equally radical was that change doesn't come through beating yourself up. You know, I think there was a way in which I was pushing myself really hard and judging myself when I didn't live up to my standards of perfection. And I first learned this at the monastery, this idea of being kind to yourself this idea of being on your own team instead of shaming and judging and berating yourself to actually treat yourself like you would treat a dear friend. That was radical to me. And then as I became a professor and scientist and started studying, you know, self-judgment and shame versus compassion, the science behind it was amazing. That, that actually when we shame and judge ourselves, it shuts down the learning centers of the brain. And when we're kind and compassionate with ourselves, it turns on our learning and motivation centers. And so that was a huge mindset shift that I could actually get to where I wanted to go. I could actually transform and heal through kindness, not through shame. I could actually exercise more and eat healthier and get my work done in a better way through kindness instead mm -hmm. of beating myself up. To extremely powerful reminders for everyone listening there that there's kind of always a choice and this idea of being kind to ourselves. I'm very curious. And I mean, I feel like most adults, we get good at beating ourselves up, right? But we're not born that way. And often you see children, they don't have that judgmental nature. They're just curious and open. So what do you think it is? Obviously, aside from specific circumstances that people might experience through their upbringing, what is it generally that puts us in that position where we have, where we learn to be that way, very critical and self-judgmental because the last few years I've paid a lot more attention and really tried to practice self-awareness and I'm getting better at it. And I feel like it's a work in progress, but it's really something you have to unlearn. So where does it come from? How do we actually even learn that in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. I think what happens is, you know, we have to be nuanced here. So it's okay to feel pain or healthy remorse when we make a mistake or we hurt someone else or we don't live up to our expectations. It's okay to feel the pain of that. In fact, evolutionarily, that's what's allowed us to kind of move forward and to live in tribes is, is that if, if I make a mistake or I hurt someone else, that shame that you feel is what kind of gives you a cue that you need to change your behavior. So I want to differentiate between healthy remorse and toxic shame. So I think it's a natural thing to feel this remorse, but what happens is we start to spiral into shame. And so it's kind of like a natural process gone awry. It's similar to thinking. Thinking isn't bad, right? Thinking actually can be really helpful. But when these thinking processes turn into worry, kind of constant rumination or worry, they, they lead to depression and anxiety. So what we need to do is kind of be more mindful or intentional about how we respond to the pain of making a mistake or hurting someone else or doing something we're not proud of. And that's really where compassion comes in, is that self-compassion is this beautiful, beautiful practice where the first step is mindfulness. The first step of self-compassion is just to pay attention to what's happening. And so often if we're in pain or we've hurt someone else, the first step is just to acknowledge it. Darn it, I made a mistake or ouch, I'm lonely, I'm in pain. Um, the second step is instead of beating yourself up is to then bring compassion and kindness. And when we do that, we're able to see clearly and then 
choose our response. I love that the first step is that awareness of just like observing because if you think about it, anything you can observe yeah. is by definition separate to you and it helps you and trains you to just, you know, that age old adage of being the observer of your thoughts. I never quite understood that. I was like, I don't really get how to observe them, but I think if I frame it in a way where I'm like, I'm aware of it and therefore they're separate to me kind of makes more sense. Like, you know, as we move through and science progresses, it feels like science is catching up to wisdom that we've had and known for years. You know, you've gone and studied in countries like uh, Nepal, which has ancient civilizations and the spiritual practices there are nothing new. And I love that science is almost proving what they've known and been practicing for years. I'd love to hear for you in your practice, in your experience, what have been the most profound scientific insights that have kind of married up with your own personal experience of mindfulness? Because I always love hearing the practicality or the evidence behind what we feel. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the reason I became a scientist and a professor, and I've spent my whole life really doing research, is, is there's this part of us, I think, especially in the West, where um, science is kind of our religion. It's mm -hmm. like we feel safe if there's scientific evidence. And so I think for me, although I had a deep spiritual experience while I was in Thailand and Nepal, it was also really helpful to have the science kind of back it up. And so when my little doubting mind would get afraid or feel like, is this really the right path? It was helpful to have the science. And a few of the kind of, I would say, parallels that have been really wonderful uh, to discern. I mean, the first that I mentioned before is neuroplasticity, this recognition that it's never too late to change, that there's always this hope. It's this beautifully um, supportive, loving mm. message in some ways that it's like, you, you're, you're never so flawed that you can't change. And in fact, all of these flaws are actually just learning opportunities. And if you can bring enough love and compassion to them, you don't know what they're going to turn into. So that's one. Uh, another one that I've recently been interested in. And so I'm very interested in intention and intention setting. And this is part of most spiritual practices, right? That before you meditate, you set an intention before you do any kind of ritual, right? There's intention setting. And what I've learned is that intentions are not just these vague mystical spiritual concepts. Intentions are actually neurochemicals that when we set an intention, it sets in motion this whole cascade of neurochemistry that helps us move in the direction of reaching our goal. So when we set an intention, and, and let me be clear, so setting an intention is about really setting your compass in the direction you want to head. Like, so maybe your intention is to be more present with your children. Okay. And you really care about this. This is important. You want to be a better mother. So I set this intention as I do my brain and nervous system release dopamine. Dopamine is the neuromodulator of motivation and learning. So it gives me this kind of energy and capacity to, to pay attention, to be more present with my children. So as I set the intention, it really helps me move towards my goal. So when you say set an intention to actually get those benefits that you've just kind of ex explored, the act to actually make it have that chemical reaction, is it that we say the intention out loud? Is it that we're writing it down? Is there a better way to do it to actually, for that to happen? I'm curious to hear your thoughts there. Great question. Yeah, great question. So um, I always, always recommend writing things down because we're 40% more likely to remember them if we actually physically write them down. However, you can set an intention just by really, you know, saying it out loud in your mind or, or bringing your attention to it. The key is it has to be something that you care about. So you can't just set an intention, you know, that just because you think it's the right thing to do or because someone tells you to. So it has to come from within because your brain and nervous system aren't stupid. So they're not going to release the dopamine if they know you don't care. The whole point is. Caring. So when I'm working with my, my patients or my students and we're setting intentions, it's not like you just do it like that. It's actually a practice of listening for what is my intention? What is the most important thing to really each day, each morning when you wake up, take a moment and say, what's important for today? And 
Maybe today, may I be kinder to myself or more patient, or may I stay connected to my body and not just live from my neck up, right? So we have different intentions. In fact, I'll give you a story about intention. When, when my son was about nine years old, um, he, his father and I had been divorced and I um, was invited to go to Europe for two weeks to teach. And I'd never been away from my son for two weeks. And two weeks is a long time when they're that age. And especially it was before kind of FaceTime. And it was it was really difficult to stay in touch with him. So I, I went to Europe to work. And um, on the plane ride home from Copenhagen, I vividly remember almost having a panic attack. Like I was so anxious that I had been away from my son for that long. I felt like I had ruined our attachment bond, that I was a terrible mother. And instead of spiraling into shame, which is what we most often do, I set an intention. When I get home, the most important thing is to reconnect with my son. So for those first 24 hours, I said, I am not going to unpack. I'm not going to check mail. I'm not going to check email. I am going to be with Jackson. So I got home. It was a beautiful day. We live in California near the ocean, and we love going to the beach. So I said, hey, Jackson, do you want to go to the beach today? And he said, sure. So I start packing up all his favorite beach gear and his favorite foods for the perfect picnic. And I'm kind of in agenda mode, you know, where I like want to get to the beach in time for the perfect sunlight and the perfect day and the perfect mom. <laughs> you know, it's not going to end well. <laughs> so I go outside of the car and I'm packing up all our stuff. And I come back inside and I say, hey, Jackson, let's go. And he's like, nah, I don't feel like it anymore. And I'm like, what? We're going to go to the beach and I'm going to show you how much I love you. <laughs> Damn it. So he walks out the front door and I'm already at the car. I'm like ready to go. And I roll down the window and I'm like beeping the horn. I'm like, hey, Jackson, let's go. And he doesn't even look up at me. He's sitting on our front porch and I start to get impatient. And I'm about to beep the horn again and yell out the window when all of a sudden I remembered my intention. What's the most important thing? All, all I care about is reconnecting with my son. I don't care what time we go to the beach or even if we get to the beach. And so I got out of the car and I walked over to where he was sitting and I sat down next to him and he was watching these ants on the ground. So I sat down and I started watching the ants with him. And after a few moments, his little body began to soften and he leaned his shoulder into my shoulder. And I could feel the sun on our backs. And that was it. That was the most important thing but we forget. A really beautiful story and um, a nice reminder. I think it's important to have had that anchor in the first place, right? So it's important for you to ask that question in the first place before you do the thing because it's so true. You can, yes. your intention can be pure and genuine, but you don't control other people or things in the world, right? So if it doesn't go to plan, reminding yourself what the most important thing is in that moment where chaos ensues uh, it is a is a really beautiful practical tool i'd like to stay on this topic of perfectionists because there is a lot of people listening right now that are high performers that have massive goals for themselves and so they do fall into that category of perfectionism and this episode is our last interview of the year and so after this there's going to be a lot of listeners that go ahead and set their goals for the new year and so I wanted to ask you what advice you have for them to be or bring a practice of mindfulness into goal setting because as a perfectionist, mm -hmm. I feel sometimes we can draft them in a way where maybe the measurements we're using to um, measure our success or our progress in that goal or even just the way we go about setting them can be a little bit yeah. I don't want to say damaging, but can maybe with a dose of mindfulness be done in a more powerful way. So curious to hear your thoughts there. Yeah. So there's a couple steps to it. The first is you always want to set your intention out of love, love instead that. of fear, right? So it's not like I need to hit this goal because I've been doing poorly, but out of out of joy, out of, out of motivation, out of excitement. And so that's the first step is to really set the intention and frame it and even word it in a way that you're bringing out the positive and what your hope is. Because what that does is, again, it kicks in motion this whole cascade of neurochemistry. It says, I care about this. This is important to me. So for example, let's say 
you know, the most common New Year's resolution is I'm going to exercise, right? And eat healthy. Now, if you do this out of um, fear and like, I, you know, I don't like the way my body looks or I'm going to get heart disease or cancer, fear actually inhibits our growth. And in fact, we saw that when, you know, in, in the US, we have a, a huge problem with obesity. And so they started doing all this fear campaign that's saying, this is what's going to happen to you. This is, you know, and, and then obesity went up because people got afraid and their coping mechanism was then to eat more. So we need to learn how to comfort ourselves um, and to make choices out of our wisdom and our kindness. So I care about you, right? I want to be healthier this year. I want to feel strength. I want to be able to pick up my children and carry the groceries. And out of my love for myself, I'm choosing to exercise Beautiful. this many times a week and to eat healthy. The other thing that's important, so that's one example, is to not set the goals too high, to make baby steps, really small steps and incremental steps. And to each time you reach a goal to reward yourself, not like, you know, an external reward, but an intrinsic reward where you say, hey, great job. Like you did it. You exercised every day for 10 minutes for five days in a row. Like there has to be shorter term goals. Um, because what happens is when we reward ourselves, it releases dopamine, which then kicks back into motion this whole motivation cycle. Okay. So we don't want to say, I'm going to exercise for 365 days. And at the end of that, I'm going to reward, reward myself. You, you want to have, you know, every week you pause and you notice on Sunday, wow, I did it. And there's this little reward. The, the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say that I think is really important is you want to stack your habits together. So if you're setting an intention to, let's say, as you said, to practice more mindfulness, right? So if maybe you want to start a meditation practice, you want to be sure to be very concrete and clear about this. So it's not just some whimsical, oh, I want to meditate more. It's I want to meditate five minutes a day and I'm going to do it each morning right when I brush my teeth. So that brushing your teeth is something you naturally do. And then you stack the habit onto something else. You're linking it so that you don't have to remember. And what this does is it removes what's called limbic friction, which is like that friction that blocks us from, from starting a new habit. So I recommend you choose from love. You make small realistic goals that you reward yourself after e meeting each one and that you stack your habits. Yeah, great the tips. Changes. The second one, particularly like setting small goals is one I've spoken about a lot this year because what I found I was doing was I had this big overarching goal, which naturally is a culmination of so many little things that you achieve in order to achieve that big thing, right? So if we don't actually break it down, and I think you could reverse engineer it too. So even if you set a big goal, it's then setting smaller goals within that. If we don't do that, and this was the trap Absolutely. I was falling into, was that I was achieving all this stuff, but feeling like I wasn't doing enough and getting nowhere because I wasn't rewarding myself and I was only focused on the big goal. Right. So I think at the outset, at the beginning of the year, focusing or remembering that that big goal is only possible, you know, it's kind of like that analogy of the staircase and the steps, right? It's only possible with one individual step at a time. And so outlining what those are and giving yourself again, another really important thing you said was intrinsic reward, something that comes from within is really important to fuel that fire. Yeah. I think in a positive way where you, again, you're not acting out of this hatred or negative place. It's more out of love for yourself. And this really gets back to this whole idea of self-compassion we were talking about earlier, which is th this radical idea of being on your own team, literally being on your own team so that when you do well, you say, hey, Erica, great podcast, like proud of you for putting in that effort, right? That there's that each little step you're cheering for yourself. And, you know, we've spent so much time trying to build people's self-esteem. And what we've learned is that self-esteem actually isn't that helpful because self-esteem abandons you as soon as things go wrong, as soon as you've made a mistake. And self-compassion, on the other hand, it sticks by your side. It's this constant ally and friend, mm, no matter very what. Very true. So let's get a little bit more granular with the concept of self-compassion because I feel like it's this, you know, it's like self-love. It's a phrase that gets thrown around and people 
admittedly kind of cringe at the idea, right? It's, it's, it sounds bizarre to say out loud, but people cringe at the idea of being nice themselves, of showing love to themselves, of finding the positives in themselves because it doesn't feel uh, normal and natural and it can feel a bit awkward from time to time. I wish that that was not the thrust of my <laughs> life's work because I cringe on the inside. And when I first was learning about self-compassion, I was like, oh, <laughs> God, no. And I really coming as a scientist and saying, the science is so profoundly positive <laughs> that you that it just doesn't make sense not to practice self-compassion. And so let me clarify a few things what it is, because when I work with clients, especially kind of, you know, high level executives and people who are like, you know, they roll their eyes when I tell them about self-compassion. And so if you're listening to this, I want you to know that's the normal response, but I want you to keep listening. So the most common misgivings I have or fears about self-compassion is one, I'll become self-indulgent, it's selfish, I'll lose my edge, you know, I'll just like sit on the couch all day and eat Oreo cookies and never exercise. But the research shows the exact opposite, that people who are higher in self-compassion, they exercise more, they eat healthier, they have better relationships. In fact, far from being selfish, their partners, their coworkers, their children rate them as more generous, as more compassionate. That every single one of the misgivings, if you look at it, is actually not backed by science. And so the other thing is people often misunderstand. They think self-compassion lets you off the hook or it's about just being nice to yourself. As I said before, self-compassion does not mean we lie to ourselves. Your brain and nervous system are not stupid. You cannot lie to yourself and still get the positive neurochemicals that I was talking about. So when you practice genuine self-compassion, what it means is you're on your own team doesn't mean you let yourself off the hook. It means, for example, when I was at the monastery, one of the biggest thing I, I learned was self-compassion. So I would be feeling pain, right? Because I'd had my back surgery and I'd be feeling pain. And instead of hating my pain, instead of being like, oh God, this is terrible. I would say, oh, sweetheart, you're in pain. Just that recognition, right? I'm not lying. I'm not pretending I'm not in pain or that I'm happy. I'm just like, ouch, this hurts. Or it was my first time ever out of the country away from my parents. And I remember, you know, it had been about three months and I started really missing my mom. And instead of saying, oh, you're such a baby, I was like, oh, sweetheart, you're sad. You miss your mom. So there is a kindness, right? I wasn't pretending. And when you bring that kindness, what happens is you release oxytocin, this beautiful hormone of safety and love. You release dopamine that I've talked about a lot of times, which is this neuromodulator of motivation and learning. And you release serotonin, which boosts your mood. So you, it's like by, by practicing self-compassion, it creates this alchemical change that then prepares you to face whatever yeah, hardship beautiful. you're facing. I think they're good ones to debunk. If just as a parting um, topic, to get granular and talk about how we actually practice that, there's some simple tools that are really effective that people can put into practice. You know, maybe they are feeling a bit awkward about it. What are your favorite go-to things to do? to practice this on a regular basis? Well, I'll share the most <laughs> cringy practice that I know because it's the most powerful. When I was going through um, a very challenging time in my life, I was, I was getting divorced. Our son was only three years old and I was terrified that I was making the biggest mistake of my life, that I was ruining my son's life. I would wake up every morning with this pit of shame and fear and self-judgment. And my meditation teacher saw what was happening and said, I think you should start practicing self-compassion. And what I want you to do is I want you to say, I love you, Shauna, every day. And I looked at her and I was like, no way. <laughs> that is so inauthentic. It's not how I feel. I'm not going to fake it. She said, fine. I just want you, when you wake up, to put your hand on your heart. It releases oxytocin. It's good for you, that, that hormone of safety I just talked about. And she said, I just want you to greet yourself. Just say good morning. Just say good morning, Shauna. I said, fine. So the next morning I woke up, took a breath, put my hand on my heart and said, good morning. And it was kind of nice, right? Instead of that avalanche of shame and self-judgment and anxiety, I just you broke said hello to myself, just like I would to Right, just to anyone else. I just broke exactly the cycle. And I kept practicing and I did this for you know a couple months. And I remember it was my birthday and 
it was the first time I'd ever been alone on my birthday. My son was with his father. And I remember waking up just before sunrise and putting my hand on my heart to do my good morning practice. When all of a sudden this image of my grandmother who had recently died came to me and she just filled me with so much love. I felt her love. And before I knew it, I said, good morning. I love you, Shauna. And it was as if the dam around my heart burst and this love came pouring in, love that I'd never felt as an adult from myself. And I wish I could tell you every day since then has been this bubble of self-love and I've never felt self-judgment again. And that's not true. But what is true is this neural pathway was established of kindness, of self-love. And I've been practicing every day since then. And the shifts in my life have been bigger than I could have ever expected. That this ability to be kind to myself changed how I parented my son, changed my ability to let new love into my life, um, changed my relationship with myself. And so I invite anyone who's listening, you don't have to say, I love you. You don't have to look in the mirror and stand there naked and love every part of yourself. You just have to wake up in the morning, put your hand on your heart and just say good morning. Very doable practice. And the vision that just came to my mind as you were talking is it's like, imagine you've got, uh, my therapist told me this story. You've got a path in a wheat field, right? It's been walked many, many times. It's very mm -hmm. clearly established. When you try and take a new path, i.e. start your morning with a good morning or I love you, you're starting to create a new path. And so you're going to have to walk it multiple times before that becomes a clear path. And as you walk that more and walk the other one less, the other one slowly starts to go away, the wheat, the grass starts popping back up. And I think that's a good visual for like the neural, neural pathways. Not that I have a sciencey background, Perfect. but that's how I understand it. Well, I think you're exactly right. What I like to say is we have these these super highways of habit, just like you're saying, we've been practicing forever and we're carving out these little country roads and, and they really are new neuronal pathways. And there's something called neuronal pruning, which means every time I take this pathway or go down that new wheat field path, I'm pruning away the bad behavior. I'm literally causing mm. that to shrivel up as I grow this yeah, new path. bit of gardening for you. <laughs> well, that's why my favorite phrase is what you practice grows Quite stronger. Quite literally. That's it. What you practice grows stronger. That's the heart of neuroplasticity. You don't have to have a science background. What you practice grows stronger. So choose. Choose your thoughts. Choose your behaviors. Choose where you put your attention. Absolutely. How long, just quickly, did you feel you practice that good morning practice before you honestly felt for yourself a difference or was it, was it instant mm -hmm. because you had order, already broken that automatic wake up and feel those negative feelings? Yeah. I have to say the first day that I did it, it, there was this kind of like, wow, that was kind of nice. There was like a surprise. I was like, wow, that felt better than shaming myself. But then as I continued to do it, it was kind of ups and downs. I was like, some days I'd be like, this is so stupid. This will never work. This is awkward. Some days I would feel nothing. And then, and this is true to this day. Some days I feel tremendous love, but no matter what happens, I keep practicing every single morning. I wake up, I put my hand on my heart. I say, good morning. I love you, Shauna, because I trust as a scientist in planting seeds. I trust if you continue to plant these seeds, they will yeah. blossom. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to leave our conversation. I want to thank you so much for your time. I'm very grateful to have sat down and shared in this conversation with you. And for everyone listening who would like to connect with you and follow along and learn from you is the best place they can go. And I'll pop some links in the show notes. Wonderful. Well, I would love to hear from everyone listening. Um, I always respond if you send me an email on my website. It's Dr. Shauna Shapiro. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Shauna Shapiro. Um, and just speaking of this Good Morning I Love You practice, I have a new book that just came out this month. It's called Good Morning I Love You, Violet. It's a children's book. I am over the moon excited about it. I've never written a children's book before, but the idea behind it is we have to start carving out these pathways early that we can learn self-compassion and it can be a resource for a whole life. I didn't know you had the book come out. So congratulations. And that's so, um, it's beautiful to hear. Cause again, as I said, we unlearn it at some point and have to relearn it. So by fostering that from a young age, I think is a beautiful endeavor. So thank you so much again. And I look forward to continue to learning from you. Thank you.